word. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us right now to let our guard down and let you in. And we offer all these things to you right now as praise to you. Lord, we offer ourselves. We just want you to do a work in us. Lord, we didn't come here tonight to have just a good time. We came to hear from you that you might, you might get heavy upon us, that we might bend our will towards yours, like we are stubborn, rebellious people, myself included, Lord, and we need your help. So, Spirit of God, come and weigh down heavily upon us tonight that we might hear your voice, heed your word, and follow you. Thank you for uh, letting us have this opportunity to gather. Thank you for, um, oh, holy God in charge of all weather. Um, allowing us the privilege of being able to gather here tonight for it was just a few days ago, Lord, that we were thinking we wouldn't even be able to do this. But in your sovereign will, you've decided to do it your way. And so we thank you for that, Lord. And we don't want to waste that time you've given us. We are here to praise and worship you. So um, please accept our, 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 our bodies now as sacrifices to you, Lord. Do what you will with us. In this place, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, so why don't we have a seat, and uh, why don't you go ahead and grab a Bible and open it to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and uh, just want to welcome you. Thank you for being here. It would really be um, lame to have nobody to talk to, so I'm thankful that you're here. Um, so so, so um, thank you to Pastor Jay. He'll be here tomorrow morning, him and Marty and Mac, and they'll be here tomorrow morning. Uh, but thank you to him, and he did such a wonderful job last week of bringing God's word to you. And um, so uh, I'm going to be preparing, I have been preparing actually, um, now that this I Choose series is done, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just try to give in to the Holy Spirit, and, and I believe he wants uh, me and you and us, we're to go through the entire book of Acts next. So 28 chapters of total insanity, okay? So that's, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get the birth of the big church, big C, right? And you're going to get the coming of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. You're going to see planting of uh, little C churches all over. You're going to see uh, jail breaks and persecution and beatings and, and, and all kinds of wizardry and, and spiritual gifts on display. Just awesome craziness. And so much to glean. I know the Lord's going to meet us there um, as he's already begun to meet me there in my preparation. But knowing that I'm going to be doing that and knowing that uh, last time we did a large book like we did Luke, it was like a year and a half to get through it. And so 28 chapters of awesomeness. So it's going to take a long time. That's heavy. And so I could feel the weight of that on the horizon. Plus just I was just feeling a little tired emotionally and spiritually a little down and physically tired and and you just you just get tired you know you get tired so I was like you know what before we get into the whole book of Acts thing why don't we uh let me just take a couple of weeks off you know and so um, that's why Jay was here uh and he did a great job handling the word of God yeah and um and then next week I'm here tonight first Corinthians has nothing to do with Acts really but um same book but same God you know what I'm saying and, and so, uh, so I'm here tonight, but then next week, uh, Pastor John Abner is going to be here, and he's going to bring God's word, and he was here before, and I know you guys all loved him, I do too, and so he's going to bring the word. Um, so I wanted, but originally I wanted to have two weeks off, like if you're going to take a break, you need to like take a break, you know what I mean, like you need to take a little bit of a break and rest your brain, it's good to go brain dead every once in a while, and just do nothing, and so I wanted two weeks off, um, but due to some scheduling and all this um, it was just not going to work that way. It's just not going to work that way. So last week, Pastor Jay. Next week, Pastor John. This week, you get me. Um, so, so, but anyway, I need a little rest for my soul. And um, I thought, you know what? A few weeks off from the preaching pressure would help untie the knots a little bit, you know? Um, it's, not, it's not the... <laughs> It's not the American pastor stuff that weighs you down, you know, the, 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 the cleaning and, and the fixing stuff and, and, and ordering supplies and paying bills and, uh, you know, brewing coffee for people. Like, 
not, not the American pastor stuff. That, that's, that's not really what is heavy at all. It's time-consuming, but it's not heavy on your soul. Um, meeting with folks uh, that are troubled, that's often in, in, in pastoring, and so you're trying to counsel through pain, and, and they've got addictions that they've chosen, and there's... There's uh, marriage problems and divorce on the horizon and, and jail time and all these financial burdens and just people have stuff. And that is a little bit, a little bit heavier because, you know, you can only be, um, for lack of a better word, barfed on um, so much. And it just starts to, you start to take on what you're hearing. And then if you love the people, you don't want to see them in that situation so you start to get, a, you feel a little bit of, of heaviness there, for sure. But that's not the heaviest part of pastoring. The heaviest part of pastoring, um, I discovered some years ago, and I want you to see it with your own eyes, too. I want you to t- do me a favor. Keep your finger in 1 Corinthians, because that's where the, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, 3, and 4. Not gonna, we're not going to read all the chapters, but we're going to read of the same issue that's mentioned in all four. But keep your finger in 1 Corinthians. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 5, just 2, 3, and 4, just verses 2, 3, and 4. This is the weight of the pastor's gig, okay? It's found right here. It's found right here. And when I read it years ago, it was like, boom. And listen, when you read this, if you're thinking about ministry, think twice, okay? Think twice because it's super, super heavy. This is what it says. Now, Peter, you guys are all probably familiar with Peter, right? One of the early church leaders, powerful guy, right? Failure often, but awesome at, at other points. And so Peter says, listen, he's, a, he's an elder. He's, a, he's a, a leader in the church. And so he says, I appeal to you, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Okay, so first and foremost, no, there's a different first and foremost. First and foremost, I'm going to be long tonight, so just be ready. Okay, Amen. first and foremost, notice there that the people are not mine. I own nothing. You're not mine. They're your gods, right? You've been purchased by Jesus Christ, by his blood. He owns you. You're a doulas. Remember what doulas is? What's that? It's a slave. You're a slave to Christ, okay? And so he is, you are his, and he's just put you under my care for him. I'm working for, I got an awesome boss. But, but, he, but he says, I want you to take care of these people that I've entrusted to you. Never, never forget they're mine. They're not yours. But he says, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. Yikes. And listen, here's the reward. When the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. Okay, listen. It's right there in that space of, of your desire to please and serve the Lord and to correctly lead his people. That's where the weight is. Okay, listen, listen. Let me, let me tell you why. Okay, first of all, I understand that 80% of Christians don't read their Bible. I understand that 80% of Christians aren't doing what you're doing right now. Okay? They're, they're, they, you know what they're doing? They're at home while I read the Bible for them. Like, I understand all that. Okay? That's most Christians. And so, therefore, I also understand because of that slackness of most people, and let's just be honest in church, Because of the slackness of people, I realize that as the teacher, as the preacher, that oftentimes I can say some things that could massively impact your next seven million years. It could could place you in heaven, and it could place you in hell. Based on what I might say, you say, oh, that sounds good. Believe it, and it puts you down. You believe it, and it puts you up. Like, I understand the weight of that, and so that should make you think more than twice about entering into ministry. And the big reason is not because it impacts people, but in the book of Hebrews, let me get it right, Hebrews 13, 17, 
it says that I will give an account to God for what I say to you. So not only could, I play, could what I say impact your decision for all eternity, and that should ma- listen, that should make you gasp for breath. But not only that, but you have to answer to the Almighty for that. He has put them in your charge. Now be a faithful steward of what I've given you and teach them well. So I've got the pressure, and all pastors do, have the pressure of making sure that you lead them in the right direction. And then you have to, if that's not enough, you have to answer to God. Someday you have to look into the piercing eyes of the one who spoke the planets into existence and say, what did you do with my people? That's not an easy thing, right? That's where the heaviness comes in, okay? And I'm telling you from someone who's now experienced, I'm not the young guy anymore, you better be called. You better be called. Don't do this because you think it's a good idea. You better be called. Often shunned, often often ridiculed, often underappreciated, most often underpaid. You better be be called to accept this type of responsibility. That's where the heaviness is, okay? It's in the preaching of God's word. That's where the heaviness is. And listen, loved ones, I want to do this well. I want to do it, I, I've tried to do it well for the last nine years. I want to I try to do it well till I'm done, and I want to do it really, really well tonight by talking about this. Um, Getting more with less. This is, what I, this is what I want to ask you. Okay? This is what this is all about. How many people think that the Bible's real? It's true. How many think that Jesus Christ is real? Powerful, right? Rose people from the dead. Rose himself from the dead. Can you pull that up? I can't pull that up. It's crazy, right? Like, this is the most amazing truth in the history of the universe is, is God. Like, it's, it's mind-blowing, right? And how many people, in, in, in honest moments in church now, okay, how many people are legit, even if you love your church, how many people are super, super disappointed with the amount of power and, and miracles and influence and, 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 and salvation and baptisms and all those things that when you read that book and you see it happen in the book of Acts, you're like, why won't it happen here? How many people are just disappointed that it doesn't? I am. I do. I'm totally, I want to, listen, I want, I want Jesus to show up more mighty in my family, he ha, and it just seems like he hasn't. I want him to show up more mighty in my church, and I just don't see it happening. I want to see him show up more mighty in our community, never mind this church or that church or this, all of them. I want to see them packed out with people who used to sin, and now they praise him with their hands lifted high. That's what I want to see. That's what everybody wants to see, but it doesn't happen. Frustration. How many people are satisfied with the amount of people are in here tonight? I'm not. And it's not that I don't appreciate you or you or you. I appreciate everyone who's here. Like I said, it would be, it'd be lame to sit here and talk to the tables. So I'm super happy that you're here. And you're important and valuable, and I love you for that. But what about all the people that are not here? There's more people not here than there are here, right? So I want to see people, I want to see people stop doing whatever they're doing out there right now. Instead of going to that bar tonight, I want to see him here. I want to see him here so bad. That's why I'm doing this, right? We're doing this for that. But it just doesn't seem to... Why isn't it... If if Jesus Christ is the Lord, and he draws people to himself, and he saves people, and he says he's going to build his church, why doesn't it seem to be happening? Like, it's, it's happening, but if he's that powerful, he's that awesome, why isn't it happening, like, in biblical proportion? Is he not the same yesterday, today, and forever? From everlasting to everlasting, is he not God? Does his word stand forever? Is he still saving people, seeking and saving that which is lost? He's still doing all those things, but we don't see it. Why? I'm frustrated. Here you go. It's not to something over here. Let's get more of the kingdom, right? How many people want to see more? Like, okay, listen. Let your kingdom come. You're into that? Let your will be done. Are you into that? No, you're not. Just being honest, I'm not either. Right? We want his kingdom to come, but, but, the, but the part that we struggle with is not, hey, bring your kingdom. It's the, hey, I want you to do what you're supposed to do to have me come. 
That's the only thing. It's not like God's unwilling to come and show up in power, right? That's what he wants. He shows off. That's what he does. But it's the, your will be done. That's the part that we struggle with, right? We want to see more of the kingdom advancing and exploding and, and permeating our city and changing the whole city. Like in, the, in, in Ephesus, with, when the gospel spread, they couldn't even sell um, idol monuments anymore. You couldn't make money being evil anymore because the gospel had changed the whole city. And we all want that in our city, but we don't see it. God hasn't changed. We're going to get more of that with less. With less, right? Let me explain what I'm talking about. All right, you ready? So, that being said, I, I, I want to just say this. The best way to accomplish the, the first Peter thing, the, 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 the care for the flock that God has entrusted to you, the best way to do that is, is to preach the word of God accurately and with clarity. Okay, now, you may have a differing opinion about how the kingdom will come and how you're going to permeate a city. Like, you may have a different opinion, um, but your opinion and, and my opinion, um, what, do they, what, what do they mean? Uh, nothing, okay? Nothing. So here's what the Word of God says. Um, Ephesians, start right here, Ephesians 4, 4 11 and 12. It's the, the leaders of the church, the pastors, the preachers, the teachers, right? It's their job to equip God's people to do God's work and build up the church, right? That, that's, 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 what, that's what we're supposed to be doing here. The, 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 the local church right here, we're supposed to be from the pulpit. That's our job. It, it's not to do all the stuff that you tell everybody, all the pastors to do. No, the Bible, God himself said, your job is to equip God's people to do God's work, right? To, to, to build up the church, right? We're supposed to be building something, right? You're supposed to be building something. Here. You're supposed to be building something, right? You're not supposed to leave it in the status quo, right? It's not static. It's supposed to keep moving and growing and improving and changing, right? You're supposed to be building something, right? So you have to have tools to build. Here, this is your job. You've got to make sure it's level. You, you look like you've got to screw loose here. That's for you, right? You've got to build something. Don't be sitting back there lazy, right, reclining. Here, how about this is a gun hammer. Hey, gun hammer. Look, you got to build something, right? Everybody has to be building. It shouldn't be sitting still. You're supposed to be doing something. Here, look, you're supposed to build something here. Build something. Paint something. Do something, right? That's the way it works. We're supposed to equip you, give you the tools that you need to go build something. Not just come in and listen and go, oh, that's a great sermon. That makes sense. That's true. That doesn't matter. You take what's true. Those are the tools, you take the tools that the, that the preachers and the leaders of the church give you so you can build up the church. That means greater number, greater trust level, greater serving, greater giving, greater prayer, greater attendance, greater helping, greater loving, greater forgiving. All the things that the Bible says, that's supposed to increase. It's supposed to build. You should never, ever be happy with the status quo. There should be a holy angst inside of you that says, one more, one more, 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 all the time. That's the way it's supposed to be. Now, what are the tools? You obviously understand that it's not a T-square that we need, right? It's not a hammer that we need, although sometimes we just need to get hammered by the Word of God, right? Jack hammered. But what are the tools? Okay. 1 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful to teach us, listen, what is right and what is wrong. And God uses it. What is the it referring to? Or referring back to what it just said. Scripture, God's word. God uses it to equip his people for every good work. All his people, everything that would ever come out of a church is done What? By organizing an outreach? No. By preaching the word of God. And when the word of God weighs, weighs down heavily upon you, maybe you'll go reach out. Maybe when the word of God weighs heavily upon you, you'll start a rev group in your house. You don't need to be instructed, begged, or asked. You'll just do it. That's our job. Preach the word of God. He uses it for every single good work. So 
equip God's people to do God's work. Well, to do God's work, it says preach the word, and God uses it to prepare you for those good works, right? He said to do it to build up the church. Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing the word of God, right? So what are we building here with these tools that are in God's word that is preached to you? Well, we're building a family of faith. That means we're building an ever-increasing group of people who are increasing in number and in trust of Jesus Christ. That's what we're building. That's what we're supposed to be building. I hope that's what you want to see built, and that's why you are here tonight, to build that thing, not to suck it in, but to do something with it. Be equipped, okay? Be equipped. Maybe you're going to hear something tonight that's going to inspire you to do something for the Lord, and don't, don't suppress that. If he says do it, you do it. Listen, all pastors, all preachers should focus on this single most important thing. And that's why Paul, the great apostle, after quoting those words in 1 Timothy 3 about, hey, all scriptures God breathed and useful for right and wrong and equipped for, for God's people. So that's why in 1 Timothy 4 he says this. So now I solemnly urge you in the presence of Christ, preach the word. Amen. That's what I want you to do. Listen, do it whether the time is favorable or not. That means do it even when they don't want to hear it. You don't want to hear it? I don't care if you want to hear it or not. Do you want to hear it? I don't care if you want to hear it. God says, do it anyway, whether the time is favorable or not. And here's the other thing, whether I want to do it or not. Maybe I get to a section of scripture, I don't like that section. I don't, like, I don't agree with that. I don't, I don't, I'm not good at that, so I don't want to preach. It doesn't matter, kid. Get back in the game and preach the word. That's what he said. Whether the time is right or wrong, favorable or not, do it. Then he says this. Here's what preaching is. Patiently, what's that mean? Keep at it, right? Keep at it. Don't preach it once. They don't get it. Oh, I'm done. Keep at it. That's what's kept me in the game. I don't see a full, the full room isn't keeping me inspired. What is, what's keeping me inspired? The word of God says patiently, right? Patiently. This is what the word of God does. Correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Right? With good, that's what the word of God does. Well, I like to go to a church. I like to go to a church to be uplifted and encouraged. Who cares what, what, why you go to church? That's what this sermon's all about. We've got to get off this whole thing about why I go to church and, why, and where I go to church. How about God places you together perfectly? That means you're called to a church. Not I, I like to go to a church where I'm encouraged and uplifted and grace and, listen, that's awesome. But the word of God says that when the word of God is preached, you're going to be corrected, you're going to be rebuked, and you're going to be encouraged. Same word. If, I, if I'm preaching a word from the Bible and you're rocking that thing really, really good, you're going to be encouraged. Hey, I'm doing all right with that. And, and Jesus is going to say, attaboy. Give you a little crack in the rear end. Say, hey, keep it up. Good job. That's encouraging, right? But sometimes you just kind of, you're doing pretty good, but just off a little bit. You do a little in-course adjustment. That's a correction. What was your name again? Kim. Hey, Kim. I'm Jesus. Nice to meet you, right? Hey, I noticed that you're doing this pretty good, but there's just like this little correction I'd like you have. And you just go, oh, okay. Right? That's cool. Yeah, it's cool. But sometimes it's a rebuke. Quit it. Knock it off, right? Quit doing that. That's way off, right? That's a rebuke. And so when the word of God is preached, one person gets encouraged, the other one gets corrected, the other one gets rebuked. And you can't go looking for a church that preaches in the style that you like. Because like, i got to tell you something. This ain't for you. It's not for you. Who's it for? Let's be specific. Who's it for? Jesus Christ said, I'm building my church. I'm building my, my church, right? So this is the, this is, this is not the job. This is the job of the pastor. 
and he should strive to do this well. And it, listen, if by God's grace he's able to pull this thing off somehow, well, some people will listen, and some people will grow, and some people will kind of follow that guy and, you know, follow his lead. That's pretty cool. It's good. The problem is everything in the hands of sinners can go awry. So even though it's cool that you would admire that guy and listen to him and follow him, just remember that food turns to gluttony and wine turns to drunkenness and sex turns to immorality. And so even this admiration of a godly man doing his job and doing it well can kind of point out some flaws that are in the American church big time. And we want to attack that thing here tonight. That's what God's laid upon my heart, and I want to attack this thing. Listen, Paul attacked it in Corinth. Four chapters, in four chapters, speaking about a lot of different things. Somehow, some way, this little thing right here made its way into four chapters. And he attacks the people that, that, listen, they were Christians, but they were misbehaving. And the church wasn't all it should be because it wasn't less, it was more. It was their own selfish things that they wanted. And so Paul was rebuking this church. He went after this cancer big time, and I want to do the same thing right here. And this less is the medicine for the cancer. There's a lot of reasons why the church in America is not growing like it should. There's a lot of reasons why our church isn't growing like it should, and a lot of that is on me, and I get that. But this, tonight, we're going to attack one of the main reasons why this isn't working out the way it should. So less is the medicine. This is what it is. Listen, less of what I like and what I want and more what God likes and what God wants, okay? That's what we need. You've got to get a hold of this, okay? You've got to get a hold of this. There's a story, I, I think it's true. Francis Chan tells it. Someone came up to him one time after the service. He's a great preacher. You know, everyone loves the guy and everything. And the guy comes up to him supposedly and says, hey, you know, Pastor Francis, you know, great message, really enjoyed that. But, you know, I just didn't really enjoy the worship tonight. I, mean, I just couldn't connect. I just didn't like the, the songs that we sang. You know, I just, I just didn't like the worship. And he just looks him straight in the eyes and goes, hey, that's cool because it wasn't for you anyway. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. People walk into a church thinking, what can I get out of this? This is what I like. This is the style that I like. This is what I want in church. So let's start here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 10. Paul says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what that means? Listen up, okay? By the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other, let there be no divisions in the church. Listen, don't, don't blow through this. Live in harmony with each other. With each other. That, that indicates nearness, right? Closeness. That doesn't mean... I'm over here, and you're over in that building, and I love you, but don't hang out with me because you're different. You're too charismatic. You're not charismatic enough. You don't speak in tongues. I do. Can't hang out together. I know you're my brother. You're my sister in Christ, but we're different, so I love you. No, live in harmony. That means different voices, right? Not clones. There's diversity in the body of Christ, but live not as clones, but diverse together, Right? Together. Embrace this, loved ones. Together. What's the opposite of that? Well, let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be, so what's the opposite of division? Of one mind, united in thought and purpose. And so he's now going to show us what division looks like. He's not going to say that they're not Christians. Right? He's not like, oh, you're an atheist and, 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 and you're a Catholic and you're, the, and, and you're a Christian, so we're all in like different camps. No, he's, he's not saying that at all. They're believers there in Corinth. But look what division looks like. 
For some members of Chloe's house have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying, I'm a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. He asked this question. It's awesome. Has Christ been divided into factions? He's like, you can see him scratching his head sarcastically, right? Um, has he? Uh, was I, Paul, crucified for you? Why are you following me? Right? What are you following me for? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. And he goes on, he says, I, I only baptized a couple of people, right? Verse 17, for Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. And then watch this, and not with clever speech. Not with clever speech, like not to be an awesome preacher. Because if I'm an awesome preacher and, and you're, oh, you're so impressed by the way I get up here and I have this new awesome way to reveal the word and it's so clever, he says. Clever. Not with clever speech, because see, if, you, if you're impressed by me, that might draw you to the altar. But it won't be real salvation, you see? He says, I don't want to use clever speech for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. Listen, if someone walks the aisle for salvation, it needs to be authentic. It needs to be because the gospel permeated their heart, not because of the way you speak or the, or the tone of your voice or the, the way that you dress or the style of the building or the songs that we sing, nothing. It's, it's supposed to be the power of the word of God piercing a heart. And that's what changes somebody, not the preacher, not the style Right? None of that should even mean anything. So here, here's why I'm preaching this now. So when I thought, <laughs> it's crazy. So sometimes the preacher preaches not out of experience, like good experience, but out of really bad. Okay? So this is my really bad. Okay? So when I thought, man, I'm exhausted and I need a couple weeks off, immediately what floods my mind is the times over the years that I've taken some time off. And, and there was times when, you know, our church was about 100 people. And I get back and there's 15 people left. I'm like, you know, and then you start thinking, man, I, I can't go anywhere, right? And, and what, listen, and, and what happens is pride creeps in because you start thinking, right, it's you. If you're not there, this is what happens, right? And I'm not saying that I'm anything special in any way. I'm just speaking facts. This is what happens. And it's not just me. Ask any pastor. When the pastor's taking time off, that's when people take time off, right? Because they're not there for the right reason. They're there because they like Pastor Moses. They like Pastor John. They like Pastor Terry. They like Pastor Randy. They like the way he does it. So if he's not there... I'm not going to be there because I don't like the way Carl preaches. I like the way Moses preaches. And so you start thinking about, listen, it's, it's across the board, man. It's across the board. When the cat's away, the mice play. That's just the way it is. And so what happens is you start thinking, I need to be there all the time. Do you know this times, this is so pathetic honesty in church, okay, from, from here. There are times that I will invite people to church. But if I'm not preaching, I'll tell them. But I'm not preaching that weekend. Who cares if you're preaching? Right? That, but that's me. That, that's what I've done. Like, thinking that I'm the great fix-all of everybody. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I planted it. I need to be there because I'm the, I'm the A player, and we don't want to call him the B player. And that's madness. That's, it's, so, it's beyond, it's sickening. But I just didn't even realize I was doing it till this week. So when a preacher preaches, he's supposed to have been worked over. I've been completely overhauled, okay, this week, realizing my pathetic attitude all the time. I do it all the time. Here's the problem, though. Here's the problem in the church, okay, and you'll see it there in the text. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Peter. I follow... Christ only. What's the common denominator here? I. 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 I like his style. I like his humor. I like his tone. I like the length of his sermons. I like the volume of his microphone. I like the songs that they sing. Saturday Night at 6 works for me. Ah, throw up. 
It's awful, right? But this is why we go to church. This is the criteria that people lay upon Jesus, whatever's convenient and, light, and, and makes them happy. This is why people walk into churches with a clipboard. Honey, we're here. Let's go to church. Oh, look, they have a nice coffee bar. Oh, and let's go check the children's ministry, make sure they have the right teachers. Oh, I like this in here, and I like that there. And the music is a little bit loud, but they do have earplugs, so that's cool. We can still say. I, they have everything that we need. As if this was made for you. As if we've built out this place, and 2,000 years ago, when Jesus said I was going to build a church, he's like, I'm going to build it for Carl. Right? That's, that's the way. We, but listen, it's funny. No one's saying that, but that's the way we act. Right? That's the way we act. I'll go to, to first this church because I like the way he preaches and I like the songs that they sing and forget where I'm called, forget where God placed me, but I like it here and I like it there and I have a better opportunity at this place to get more stage time and I can sing and I can lead. Listen, there was a time in this church that it was so filled with gifted musicians and preachers and people, it was insane and they all walked for better opportunity, completely ignoring the calling that God had put on them to be here. And they left. Wrong. Wrong. You don't get to pick your church. Jesus Christ says that I place them together perfectly, and as each person does their work that I called them to, it makes the others to grow. It doesn't matter what church you like or which one you want to go to. I like his style. I like his this. I like the way he does it. I like the version he uses. I like what he puts on the screen. I like the this. I like the that. And this is why the names of leaders are often more famous than the name of the church they serve in. And it's wrong. It's wrong. So here's the correction from the word of God. Right there in verse 10, you just read it. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. What's their thought here, these people? And, and, it's, and it's rampant in our church in America, too. What's their thought? I like this guy. I like that guy. I like this church. I like that church. I like, I like, I like, I follow this guy. I like this guy. Rather than verse 18, look at verse 18. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are heading for destruction, but we who are being saved, Christians, know it's the very power of God. Listen, focus on the messenger creates division focus on your messenger preferences and what they say and how they do it i like that guy that creates division in the church but focus on the message of jesus christ that bring that doesn't just bring unity that is unity of thought and purpose because they're all going for this reason i want to i want to hear the gospel and i want to meet the the god of the gospel that's why i'm going to church i don't care if moses is preaching i don't care if jay is preaching i don't care if michael or nick are preaching i just want to i just want to meet with jesus and tell him he's awesome and i want to hear his voice in my ear whispered that's what i want yeah. that's all i want that's what church is supposed to be about right just preach listen he says christ hasn't been divided no one's been baptized, dunked in, 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 in my name. They've been preached God's word, God saved them, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, right? So what's your job? Preach the message. Preach the word of God. As a matter of fact, he even goes after style here. Like, this is what people like, and they decide what church they want to go to, and they decide what weekend they're going to come to based on who's preaching. I'm not ripping anybody here because... Those who do it don't need to be named. They just know that that's what you... And listen, I'm just going to say it right now. I do it all the time. I'm a huge fan of certain preachers online. And they have preaching schedules on their website. I never thought twice about it until now. And I'm like, should that matter? So if Pastor James isn't there and his kid's preaching, I should... I don't want to watch that because he doesn't engage me. What's wrong with me? I have a problem. Right? If he's preaching the word of God, does it matter? Why do, I, why do we have to have a preaching schedule? And I, why do I turn certain guys off because I don't like their style? What I should be doing is hunkering down, keep my seat, and seek Jesus in what he's saying. 
I need to hear his voice. That's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for his style points. I don't care if he can wax eloquently up there. I don't care about his humor, his jokes, his attire, and his muscle shirts, and he's a jacked up, you know. Not everyone's Stephen Furtick, man. I know it's hard to believe that I'm not, but you know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But it doesn't, it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. So Paul attacks this whole style thing and who's the best preacher and who's not. He says in, in verse 21 there of the first chapter, he calls the, pre he calls the preaching of all those guys, including himself, foolish. It's foolish preaching. Verse 17, he says, look, at, I don't ever use clever speech. In, in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I don't use lofty words or impressive wisdom to tell you God's testimony. And in 2.4, he says, my message and my preaching were very plain, not clever or persuasive. He's just a regular dude who got up and just clearly, accurately preaching God's word. And the body of Christ followers, like you guys right here, in this church should focus on the message, not the messenger. Right? Less focus on the packaging and more focus on the product that's in the box. That's what we're looking for. And listen, if that, th this could cure a big problem in our churches if people would get a hold of this. You're not there for your preference and the style that you like. And you just, it's such, it's so, we're so inoculated and so numb to it, we don't even know we're doing it. And I do the same thing. You, people ask you all the time, and they'll say, hey, what church do you go to? Oh, I go to Revolution. Yeah, I like that place, man. I like that preacher. You might say that, right? That's all fine and good. I preach to the combo. But that doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter if you like me or you like my style, right? What really matters? What's coming out of my mouth? That's what should matter. That's all that should matter. Let me ask you guys a question. This is so crazy. I don't know why, but I have to ask this. And I beg you, be honest. I wish we had more people here tonight. Oh, my gosh. I hope we have a bunch more people tomorrow. You've got to answer me honestly, okay? You've got to answer me honestly. How many people come here faithfully and don't like my style? Raise your hand, man. It's okay. I commend the both of you. I commend you. You know what that is? Calling. Calling. You're called here. What keeps you coming back to a church that you don't agree with, that you don't like the way he yells at you, you don't like the length of his, he goes two hours and 20 minutes, what the heck's wrong with this guy, right? What makes you come back here? What makes you come back here is you've said it. Because God called us here. I've heard you both say that. I mean, listen, when you are called, when you listen, when you heed God's call to a church, it doesn't matter who's preaching. When you're in the sweet spot of God's will, it is sweet all the time. That's what you're looking for. You're not looking for the church that you like. I don't like coming here sometimes. <laughs> but I'm called here, right? I could get a job at a bigger church with more pay, right? I could do that, but I, I don't because I'm called here. That's the most fulfilling, purpose-filled life is when you're, when you're heeding his call, right? That's what I commend you for not letting me decide your church for you. That's not the way it should be. Okay, so let's just go on here. Paul again, attacks our tendency to focus wrongly yet again in chapter 3, uh, verses 4 through 9. Look here again. You'll see it, similar stuff. He says, when one of you says, I'm a follower of Paul, and the other says, I follow Apollos, and of course, he could have easily said, I follow Peter too, but he didn't, but it's the same thing. He says, aren't you just acting like the people of this world? After all, who is Apollos? This is kind of cool. And who is Paul? He's talking about himself. He's like, who am I? I'm nothing, right? And we all look at Paul like this great, you know, the greatest apostle who ever lived, like church plant and beast mode guy. I want to be like him. Right? And he's like, I'm nothing. Who am I anyway? He says, and who's Paul? We are only God's servants. Through whom, not because of, but through whom you believed the good news, the gospel. 
Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. Like we're just doulos, remember? Slaves of Christ. That's all we are. And when you guys are all looking at us like we're something awesome, we're going to go to your church, we're going to follow you. And he's like, I'm nothing, man. I just said some things plainly, not clever, not persuasive. I didn't try to win you over in an election. I just told you Jesus Christ, sinless son of God, he came to save you, went to the cross for you. Boom. Remember what he said? When I came to you, fear, trembling, Christ on the cross and him crucified. That's it. And people are getting saved like crazy. So he's like, I'm just a, I'm just, we're just servants, right? He says, I planted the seed in your heart, and Apollos watered it, but it was God. See where he goes, to give, see where the credit goes? He doesn't take any credit. He's so humble, it's so awesome. But it was God who made it grow. It's not important. See how he just downgrades everything about himself? It's not important who does the planting. Or who does the watering. In other words, it doesn't matter. They're both preachers, right? It doesn't matter who's doing the preaching. It doesn't matter who's leading the Sunday school class, the small group, who's preaching from the pulpit. We're just getting up, preaching the truth, the good news, and God does something with that. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. See, he makes everything else small, and God is big. When one plant, the one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose. You see, the leaders understood this whole idea of being united in mind and purpose. And they, he's elaborating on that right now. But it was the people who were saying, yeah, I like the way you do it the best. And I like the way you do it the best. So I'm following you. And, and, and we're not going to hang out with you guys because we're going to go out with you guys. It's the people, they were, they were taking this admiration of a man of God who's doing his job and, and idolizing him and making him the most important thing. And that's not what's supposed to happen. Through nine, what am I supposed to read here? Okay. Uh, the one who plants and the one who, who waters work together with the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. For we are both God's workers and you are God's field. You are God's building. When, listen, the message here is this. When the messenger preference trumps the message, you've got a problem. You've got a problem, right? I, 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 this is where it crushed me this week. Remember I told you I, I tell people, but I'm not preaching this week? Like somehow I'm the great savior of the world? So on Wednesday night... Not this Wednesday, but the one before. Remember, we were talking about on Wednesday night that there, let's, let's be proactive. Let's be praying for that one person you'd love to see come to church, love to come to know Jesus Christ. Let's start to pray for them for the next couple of days and then offer an invitation, offer to pick them up, right? Remember we talked about that? So I took it seriously. I was given, I was given the advice. I want to be able to do it. So I was praying for my buddy Sean. The problem was, in my stupid, pathetic mind, is that I wasn't preaching that week. So I'm like, man, but I'm not preaching this week. As if Jay's not good enough. Like, I love this man. He's been doing it for 35 years. And he's preached here several times. Doesn't he always tell, tell us the truth? Great guy, right? He could share the gospel like anybody. And I'm thinking, I, but I'm not going to be here. What? <laughs> what's wrong with me? Yeah, that's what's wrong with me. But like, if, 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 it's the message, right? It just says it. It's the message. If the, if the gospel's presented and the Holy Spirit's in that, it's going to pierce a heart. They're going to come to the altar. God doesn't need my help. And I thought that he needed my help. So, so I was like procrastinating, then it hit me. Wait a minute. This is actually the best time to invite him. This is when it finally won me over. I let the word of God bear its weight upon me. I started realizing maybe, no, 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 no. This is the perfect week to invite him that I'm not going to be preaching because heaven forbid he gets in here and goes, because he knew, because we were all drink, drinking buddies, right? So he, he knows me and now he'll see a totally different me. And sometimes you can get kind of caught up in that frenzy of, wow, this is kind of cool. Look at it. it happened to him. It could happen to me. And so I just go forward, right? 
It's like going to camp. The kids go to Christian camp, right? You're getting baptized, so I'm going to get baptized. And you're getting baptized, so you're going to get baptized. Because you just kind of get caught up in the moment. And heaven forbid Sean would come to the altar and give himself to Christ because of me. I'm thinking, man, no, 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 no. The best time would be if, if Jay's preaching. Because then if he comes to the altar, it's the gospel that brought him there. And I needed to work this thing out in my brain because it's so broken, man. I needed, to, I needed to be fixed, right? So it says here, this is the, the indictment. He says, when you do this, you're acting like the people of this world. <laughs> you know what's really sad? I have Romans 12, 2 memorized. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. I have it memorized, and I still was doing it. That's a problem. That's a problem. It's a problem for a lot of us. We know Bible. We have it memorized, and we won't live it. And that's a problem. <laughs> Less me, Lord, please. Less me. See, there's this thing, there's the autonomy of the local church, which is good. Autonomy means I stand alone. The, the autonomy of the local church is beautiful. It's biblical. You know, Paul would appoint elders in a church, and then he would put them in charge of that thing, overseeing that, and then they would go on to the next city and do it again. And so the autonomy of the local church is, is biblical. That means it stands alone. You don't have to answer to some, you know, corporate office up in Cleveland somewhere to some dudes in the office that, are, that don't even know who you guys are, right? So elders are appointed at a church. They're, they're in relationship with the Lord. They're in relationship with each other. And, and through their time with the Lord in his word, they're, they're supposed to be determining how to lead his people into green pastures, right? That's good. What's not good is this autonomy of the individual Christian, okay? This whole idea of... Uh, we just do what's ever right in our own eyes. Right? That's all through the Old Testament. It's never good. It always brings God's judgment. Okay? What that is is anarchy. It's craziness. There's no order in that. That's not the church. When everyone gets to decide what's best for them, this ain't Oprah. Okay? This is the church of Jesus Christ. God desires for his message and his name to be preached and exalted, and God's people should desire that as well but not seeking to hear it the way that they like it. That's not the way that it works, okay? Is the Bible, is God's word being proclaimed? Is Jesus Christ being lifted up? Less of me, more of him. That's what the church is supposed to be. The proper perspective on the leadership of the church, the preachers, the pastors, the teachers, you see it there, and we just read it. It says that we're just servants. We're just servants, it reminded me of Jesus' words in Luke 17, 10, where he said, when you obey me, you should merely say, I'm an unworthy servant simply doing my duty. I'm just doing my job. Okay, look, I'm nothing. I'm nothing, Paul said. I'm nothing, I say. The good news is everything. The author of it is everything. And it was God that worked on you, not me. I just showed up and did my job. And Apollos showed up and did his job. And Peter showed up and did his job. And Paul showed up and did his job. And Pastor Jay last week showed up and did his job. And Pastor John next week will show up and do his job. And as a family of faith, your job right here is to desire the message and the one that it's about. Period. End. That's a church. God's word proclaimed. The Lord is lifted up. True worship of Jesus Christ. All eyes on him only, not on anyone else ever. Not what I want, but what God wants. And any real man of God, according to what this says, any real man of God doesn't desire the praise of people, just the approval of God, right? Right? Look what it says there in verse 8. Both will be rewarded for their own hard work. God's going to reward us. God will say, good job. God will give you a crown. Right? We're just what the Bible says. God's servants. God's workers. And nothing more. Ever. 
I don't care if you're the bishop of the United States of America. You're nothing but a servant of God, a worker. So we don't choose what church we attend because of the preacher or what weekends to attend based on who's preaching or what songs are being sung. Listen, I, I, I've been doing this a long time. I know people, and if it's you in this room, receive it. I hope, I hope you'll receive it well. I know people who come to church and they've said, you know, I don't really, I don't really like the music. I don't come for the music. I just, I just come in a little bit later because I want to hear the message. And it dawned on me, like the message, so if, if you're coming in to get to be taught and instructed and encouraged, right? You, you want to learn something. That's what the message is all about, right? That's kind of for you. That's what I'm doing. All right? I'm, I'm, Jesus doesn't need, he, need, he doesn't need to hear this, right? He's got this down pat. He wrote it. You don't need my help, right? Who needs help? We do, right? But it just dawned on me this week when I was preparing, the message is for you. The music's for him. And yet, right, that's what happens. I don't come because I don't like the music. This ain't for you, bro. <laughs> right? Come on. I, don't, I, I only come for the message. Right? So, you, so you're, doing, you're coming for you. And, and they don't realize. And they, I, listen, I wasn't realizing it either. This is all new to me too. And God just revealed this and opened up my awareness of it this week. But this is rampant in the church. Do you know how many people? I, could, I, I have a list of connect cards on my desk like that. Of hundreds, probably a thousand people that have come through this church. Oh, I love it here. 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 And they're as gone as quick as they came. Because I preached too long and too loud and too harsh. They didn't like the band. We have the best band now ever. All the time because they didn't like it. Church isn't for you. <clears throat> See, we all, for the most part, we go to church according to what we want instead of seeking God's calling. Er, 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 revolution alert, revolution alert. We need a revolution. Right? We need a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. That's what we need. Right? That's what the church in Jesus Christ needs big time. Right? We need a shift in the way things work. See, this type of attitude is so common in America where there's not just a church in every corner. There's two. Where we get to go pick the guy we like the best. Listen, the only way this church is going to grow is if they love Jesus the best, because this is what you get when you love Moses the best. Right? An empty room. It's got to be about Jesus. All these churches on every... every in Eustace, there's, 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 there's like five or six, Boom! They're like car dealerships. If you don't like a Hyundai, go buy a Kia. If you don't like a Kia, go buy a Nissan. If you don't like a Nissan, go buy a Honda. Everything is about what you want. And it's like that for the church. Lake Eustace, El Shaddai, Lake Haven, Orange Avenue Church of Christ, Believer's Voice of Victory or something over there, and then we were there, and then one fire's there, and then Epiphany Anglican is the stones throw away, and like, what is going on? What's going on? Everyone gets to pick which one they want. This isn't a restaurant, right? If you don't like Red Lobster, you just go to Olive Garden. That's what's going on in our, because that's what we're taught, right? That's the way our culture is. It feeds our ego, and so you get to choose what you want. And then the other thing is, too, is like, is YouTube, and I watch YouTube, but on YouTube, right, it's the same thing. You, you get to pick your favorite guy. Well, I, I like Joyce Myers, but I don't like uh, Beth Moore. And I, and I like John Gray, but I don't, I don't like Prince or I, you know, whatever their guys are. I don't, I don't know. I don't, we're just, like, we get to pick and choose. And if we don't like this guy, you turn it off. And that's cool on YouTube, right? But YouTube isn't a family of faith that's been called together to, imp, to serve each other and to serve the greater community that God has placed it in. The local church is that. That's what we are. And so 
You can't act like that. You can't just get to pick and choose. You have to hear God's call. Where's God calling you? I had a young couple come in here three weeks ago. Lovely young couple. Any pastor would love a wife and kid, uh, a wife, a husband and wife and two seven or eight-year-old kids, right? Perfect, right? And he's asking me about stuff, and he's over with me praying over there, and he's crying. I'm like, we're praying with him and stuff. And I told him, I said, because uh, he said he hasn't gone to church in a long time, but he knows he should go. And instead of saying, hey, you know what, we have this and we have that, and I'd like to do this, and I'd like to help you that, I told him, I said, you know what I would recommend you do? I would take the next week or so. If you get a chance, maybe fast, and just try to listen to God's call. If he sends you here, awesome, I'd love to have you here. If he sends you down to the road, to the warehouse, awesome, just go there. Go where God's calling you. Let him build his church. Don't do it on your preferences and what you want, what you like. The local church is that, is that family of faith that's been called together. So when you talk about the different churches as car dealerships and YouTube, I'm saying like that's the world that we live in. And so we carry that mentality of choosing the kind of car we want and this Home Depot and Lowe's. And what are they, how, do they, how do they market things? They market things so that you'll like it. That's what gets you there. And we carry that mentality into the church. And we try to build the church the way you like it so that you'll want to come instead of going, be still. Where are you calling me? Where do you want me to serve you, Lord? And if everyone would heed that, it wouldn't matter who's preaching because you'd be there in the center of God's will, and that's sweet. You see here in the local church, you see in chapter 4, verses 21 through 22, it says that uh, all the people in the church, Paul, Apollos, Peter, all of them, they all belong to us. They've been given to us as gifts from God, and all of them should be used, not one more important than the other, but all of them should be used to advance Christ's kingdom in this world. That's what those people are for. And that's the way a church should be run. As each person does their own special work, it helps the others to grow, and the entire church is healthy, growing, and full of love. Now, again, Paul attacks the same problem again in chapter 4, the first four verses. So look at Apollos as mere servants of Christ, oh, Apollos and me as mere servants of Christ who have been put in charge of explaining God's mysteries. Now, a person who is put in charge as a manager must be found faithful. As for me, it matters very little how I might be evaluated by you or any human authority. I don't even trust my own judgment on this point. My conscience is clear. Like, he's like, I think I'm doing right, you know, but that doesn't even prove that I am. <laughs> it's the Lord himself who, examine, who will examine me and decide. So ultimately... The problem is that we conduct ourselves in the church according to our own likes and desires above God's. And we kind of think that, and it's proven by our actions, not our words. No one would actually say this, but we actually, we, we, we live in the church kind of like that Christ belongs to us rather than the truth, which is we belong to Christ. We belong to Christ. And, and so we have this idea of like, I can do my Jesus thing this way in the way I like, at the time I like. And you can do your Jesus thing, and I'll do my Jesus thing the way that I like it. But the truth is, is that Jesus owns you. You belong to him. Doulos, you're a slave of Christ. So you see there in 4.1, he just lowers again all, 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 all the things that we would falsely admire. He's like, no, we're just servants, man. We're not someone to be loved and, and idolized and followed like that. We're just servants. So again, he lowers what we admire falsely and we exalt and he exalts the gospel. Uh, us admiring and loving things too much the way we do. Uh, early church leader St. Augustine said, he called it uh, heart sclerosis. He said, by nature, our hearts love the wrong things. Okay? And that's who we are. And 
He says, I'm just an unworthy servant, right? Just doing my duty, just doing my job, plain and clear, nothing fancy. And because of that, people would begin to follow him, right? But he was like, I I, I don't want your approval. I'm not seeking that, bless you. I'm not seeking your approval. I don't even I don't need your approval. And it didn't even matter if he himself thought he was doing a good job. Right? What I think, he's like, what I think doesn't even matter. And this is the Apostle Paul, right? He says, it doesn't even matter, okay? So, thank you for sticking with me all this long. I don't know how long I've been preaching for 45 minutes or 50 minutes or something like that. But all this to say this, all that, all that, to say that, you know, revolution, again, is a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. And so the status quo in, and I'm preaching, I'm, listen, this is, if I could, I could preach a message, you know, I wish, uh, this is a, a message that a lot of pastors would like to preach. Um, but the status quo is that um, we're playing church. And playing church means attending where and when I want to, according to my likes and my desires and my style and my convenience. I grab some Jesus when I want and how I want him, right? That's, that's consumer-driven culture that we live in, and we carry it into the church, and it shouldn't be that way. So the shift in the status quo is found in Matthew 16, 24, where it says, I think we have it up on the screen. There it is right there. That's the shift in the status quo that needs to take place if we're going to be Jesus Christ's church and he's going to build his church. If any of you, that's all of us, wants to be my follower, right, not just believe in him, but my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, right? And selfish doesn't mean bad. Selfish just means that you're at the center of it. You're making choices based on what you want. You need to turn from that and then take up your cross, right? What's that mean? Die to yourself. You need to die to yourself. That's how you turn from your selfish ways. You need to say, it doesn't matter what I like. It doesn't matter what I want. God, what do you want? And you listen. And you follow him. Turn from your selfish ways. Take up your cross and follow me. Jesus Christ established his church. And it is to be run and built according to his good pleasure and plan. The church is built on a message, not a messenger, not on the style of the building, not on the volume of the song, not on the preacher's style choices. It's built on a message. It's on this message, that every person is conceived broken, and therefore our unperfection forbids us to be in the presence of a perfect God. But knowing that broken people can't fix themselves, this same perfect God, compelled by love, offers a way for the broken to be made whole and the guilty to be found innocent by sending his perfect son, Jesus, who is by his very nature God himself. And he sends him to your cross to absorb the full wrath of God's hate for your sin. And this love makes forgiveness of sin available to anyone who would accept Jesus Christ as their sole Lord and Savior for their life. That's the message. That's the gospel, and that's all that matters. That is the power of God at work, saving all who believe, not the preacher, the building, or the pews. That's the gospel. Listen, God loves you. He died for you, and he's called us, you, out of the world to be his church, to be his bride, to spread his reign by serving him, praising him, and making disciples of Jesus Christ from everyone that he brings into your path. We don't look for what we want or like. We seek to advance a kingdom where Jesus Christ is on the throne by dying to self, not seeking to please ourselves. What's being attacked here in 1 Corinthians by Paul isn't just simply the admiring of a godly man. It's the preeminence of self that our culture promotes that is warring against what Jesus Christ is trying to do in and through you. That's the problem here. 
So listen, as we finish up here, finally, we've, we've turned the corner. We're landing the plane here, okay? Let's choose, okay? Let's choose as God's people, not my people, not Jay's people, not next week pastor, as God's people. Let's choose to change how we think. Let's choose to change how we practice this thing. And let's choose to change the world around us by bringing the beauty of a Christ-centered, biblical living to a world starving for a way to live that brings peace and blessing and not just more unfulfilled longing. God's church, loved ones, is all of us together, no matter the preacher, no matter the building, no matter the songs, no matter the paint, no matter the coffee, no matter the time, all of us who have been called together by God actively, listen, lowering ourselves and actively involved in making disciples so that the name of Jesus Christ will be lifted high as his rule and reign spreads across our cities that he's planted us in. And the way we get more of this is to get less of what? Point of me. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I am uh, feeling very, very much like Paul. Um, and he said it, so I'm saying it. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks in this room, including myself. Jesus, you are the sovereign king of the universe, and this is your church. And you are the head of the church. You are the, the, the shepherd of the church. And, and it is our job, all of us, all of us, to bend our knee to you and to heed your word and do as you say. We are all just unworthy servants doing our duty. Father, I, uh, I would ask that you would help our church to be different. To not be like this failing model in America where churches are closing by the thousands every year. In a, in, a, in a culture that is self-promoting, everything we want, everything we want, seeking to please the consumer, and it has permeated your church. For that, I repent. I don't want to be that guy anymore. So, Lord, I pray that you'd, you'd help us to make a shift in our mind, in our heart right now, all of us here in this room. You changed the world with 12. There's more than that in this room. So you, I know you could change our city. If we would just grab hold of this truth that this church is about you, not about me, not about us. It is absolutely about you, for you, through you, to you, everything about you. Don't just let this be another message that's proclaimed, Lord, but let it be medicine for the cancer that is in us as a church here in America. Let it be different, Lord. Let it be different. It seems appropriate, Lord, to just say that as we go to this time now where we usually give our offerings, that that same attitude is warring against us right now. We feel as though that the resources that are in our pockets and our bank accounts are for us. And all the while, that song we sang earlier was so appropriate. It's your breath in our lungs. So, Lord, would you change the priority in our mind, in our heart? Would you help us with making you and your kingdom and advancing your kingdom to the ends of the earth? Would you make that our new priority? And would you help us as we give, Lord, to give with that type of attitude? Would you replace fear with gratitude? Would you replace self with others? Loved ones, I just want you to take a few moments and pray personally, just you and the Lord. And then whatever he leads you to give, 
There's baskets on the corner of the stage and there's boxes on the back walls. You can give whatever the Lord leads you to give. If you want to give online, you can do that at our website too. Or there's a little giving station out front. You can do that. Whatever you want to do. But just, I would just ask you to pray. Don't just get caught in a habit or a tradition or a ritual of 10% or, you know, whatever. Just pray. Just pray. And let him and his kingdom and his preference, what he wants, take precedence in your life. And then give accordingly. So just take a few moments, please.